Welcome back to FinTech Festival India's Pune Micro Experience, everyone. Ever since the pandemic turned our lives upside down, consumers have been encouraged to use contactless payment systems instead of cash, which can carry the SARS-2 virus. And since then, the challenge for financial institutions and merchants has been matching consumer expectations, which have evolved considerably. Prior to the pandemic, tap and pay cards were used as they were quick and easy. Consumers' perceptions of speed and convenience have improved since then, with safety and minimal touch taking preference. The pandemic might subside, but contactless payments will continue to grow in popularity. Not only are contactless payments becoming more popular, but how consumers engage with businesses has also changed as a result of the pandemic. Our next panel will be discussing this in detail and will be sharing an outlook on what's to come in payments. So without any delay, let's uh, welcome our next panel to the stage. This panel is moderated by Ms. Richa Mukherjee, Member Face, Director of Public Policy and Corporate Affairs at PayU India, who is joined by Mr. Kostabroy, Senior Payment and Solution Architect, Monetary Authority of Singapore. Mr. Jose Thattel, Chief Executive Officer and Co-Founder, Fee Commerce. Mr. Sharan Nair, Chief Business Officer, CoinSwitch, and Mr. Mandar Agashe, Founder, Vice Chairman, and Managing Director, Sarvatri Technologies. So over to you, Richa. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm very excited to be part of today's panel discussion. The topic is very relevant, and the reason for my excitement is that it's been two years that we have had any offline event in last two years because of COVID and also the topic that we are going to talk about today and of course our dynamic panelists that we have in today's discussion. Uh, so we have with us today Mr. Kostub Roy, Senior Payments and Solutions Architect, Monetary Authority of Singapore, Mass. Mr. Jose Thatil, Chief Executive Officer and Co-Founder of e-commerce. Mr. Sharon Nair, Chief Business Officer, CoinSwitch and Mr. Mandar Agashe, Founder, Vice Chairman and Managing Director, Sarvatru Technologies. Before I start the discussion today, let me just lay out the landscape of digital payments since last two years, especially in the COVID times, how it has spanned. We all know that COVID-19 has led to the deterioration and deacceleration in the demand of goods and services. There was very low pent-up demand in the economy and definitely in India which ultimately led to fall in fewer payments being made. And many industry experts, they claim that it was a watershed moment on how people, including consumers, merchants, traders, they conducted their transactions and affected their business transactions as well. There has been contrary results as well among the Indians on the impact of COVID-19 and its consequent lockdown on payments. A majority of the respondents said that they reported no change of their usage in the digital payments. About 33% said that they use digital payment more, more often than before, and while 9% made online payments exclusively. The priority on digital payments have been on a couple of points, first being convenience, that you can process the payments anytime, anywhere, especially when lockdown and social distancing norms were, uh, were a prevalent thing. Uh, and, of course, accessibility, which is, was an add-on factor to the solution, to the situation where it, is, it was able to penetrate amongst the masses, which via normal conventional means would not have been possible in such a weary time. So this definitely has been a market disruptor. Taking a cue from this, the industry players from digital payments, they took the opportunity of scaling their business and innovating with different products and services, be it new age fintech models, be it alternate lending models, buy now pay uh, later models, which saw phenomenal returns. And of course, then we had crypto revolution and of course, uh, the means of making accessible the UPI products to many customers uh, as much as possible. With this, I turn over to my panelists for discussion today and start by asking a common question to all of them in terms of how they have seen the payments evolving, especially in the COVID times. Uh, I request all the panelists to please keep their responses under two minutes for the sake of time. Uh, so I'll start with Sharon. Uh, Sharon, um, what do you think is COVID-19 the ultimate disruptor in the payments industry? Uh, I, I certainly think it is. Uh, for one, 
it, it has acted as a catalyst, right, uh, for the kind of digital payment that we see today. And I think as a country, we've been ripe enough uh, to get into that ecosystem because we had this very robust UPI system in place. Uh, the cost of our data uh, in India is dramatically lesser than anywhere else in the world. And you have uh, low cost mobile devices that let you make these payments penetrated into diet to entire three cities. But because I come from the crypto industry, one aspect that I uh, have also seen develop, uh, not necessarily just because of COVID, was how central banks across the world started talking about CBDCs and what that could do in terms of uh, ushering in the new era of digital payments, right? Uh, because during this whole pandemic situation, a lot of uh, funds had to be earmarked for specific purposes and, and the problem always remained as to how do you ensure that proper distribution of that happens uh, and it reaches the exact benefit, beneficiary. And I believe that with, with the kind of uh, thought process that's going around with CBDCs across uh, central banks, the idea that a programmable money which can be earmarked for a specific purpose uh, and cannot be used for purpose B uh, is, is something that's been a landmark change during this COVID times. Thank you, Sharon. I'll ask the same question to Kostav. Do you want me to repeat that? No, no, I, I think I got the uh, question, Rishan. Thank you very much and good afternoon to all of you. Uh, and Sharon, you brought up a very, very valid, pertinent question as well. But I just want to kind of address this in a much more macro state. Uh, I want to go back a little bit and say that uh, every time there's a payment disruption which happened in the history beat or cash or credit or the first use of the plastic money or the invention of the atm to currently the blockchain which we are looking at they all help payment to be much more faster and more efficient what i felt most importantly for this particular disruption of the covid 19 is it is a disruption of the last mile barrier of the payment digitization what we always had, if you look at, if you, if I have to look at the payment journey uh, for the last few years uh, to a decade, uh, we can break it up into a pre-pandemic and a during pandemic kind of thing. And in pre-pandemic, there was this, this digital ecosystem had made substantial progress in the issuance side. And COVID led this need to the push to the acceptance side. So let me explain this. When I'm saying the issuance side, the, the the most of this economy had by that time, be it a developed or emerging, had some state of readiness, uh, which is your supply side, which is like the credit cards, debit cards, wallets, QR codes, payment infrastructure like the faster payment system, proxy based systems. They were all ready. The only thing which was lacking at that time was the acceptance side, where this high cost barrier which was there, which is your interchange fee inertia of the merchants to move into digital, even the consumer because of the high cost of the digital. So the cash remained the key king for the B2C kind of a payment and for B2B the checks remained the same. But what has made this COVID infrastructure, uh, this COVID on the onset of the COVID is the change in the mindset and the behavior of the users, the merchants, which has kind of accelerated the views of digital means in the last couple of years. So I think that's what is the most important thing which we have seen. And that's the fallout which you're seeing into getting into cryptos, getting into other ways of, of a technology evolution, which we are seeing in the payment Some phase. very valid points there, Kostub. Uh, and I think that's the reason RBIO as well set up this payment infrastructure development fund last year and they allocated uh, 1,500 crores to it, if I remember the amount correctly. Yes, very well points. I'll pose the same question to Jose now. Uh, your response, please. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Richa, and a very good afternoon to all of you. Um, I think Kaustub uh, wonderfully put it from a macro perspective. Uh, I'd like to address it more from an India perspective. You know, So uh, with the current government, right from the very beginning, there has been this focus and thrust on digitization in payments, right? And then came Demon. This was almost five years ago. And that was really the spark of uh, in the, in the growth of digital. Uh, fintechs like us realized the power that, uh, you know, we could actually pro uh, enable both consumer and merchant with from a digitization standpoint. And there was a emphasis based on innovation right from Demon. Uh, come the pandemic, I think w when the pandemic struck, I think initially there was a, a complete feeling of despondence. There was no transactions ha 
happening, shopping went down, consumers didn't uh, want to pay. But gradually over a period, people realized that, yes, life has to go on. Hmm. But move to, you know, maybe online methods of shopping, uh, other ways of adapting to it. And that's where I think the whole, um, the at least the fintech ecosystem to a large extent innovated greatly. And accompanied by, uh, you know, incentives from the government in terms of lower interchanges, lower fees for the merchants and stuff like that. I think it, it, it became like the tipping point in the sense from a growth perspective. Uh, the other thing is also uh, what we have seen is uh, in the pandemic era, uh, payments uh, and payment solutions are no longer a commodity because they realize that there are wide use cases out there which still has a lot of friction. So therefore, can we actually cater solutions to these specific use cases? So like, for example, in the pandemic, there was doorstep delivery which happened. You couldn't go to your grocery store. So now can, is a payment at a doorstep similar to what happens online or at in-store? No. So there were solutions designed for. So you have dime a dozen examples for that. So I think one is, as Kostop said, acceptance became um, you know, right. easier, yes. far easier. Second is solutions started getting catered to specific large use cases, whereas the initially the thought was it's, uh, it's like a one size fits all, which right. uh, you know, sort of uh, changed. Sure, thanks. Manda, your views, please. Uh, during this lockdown, a uh, few of the critical uh, institutions which were open, uh, like hospitals and medical shops, Banks were also open. Yes. So banks were continuously working because uh, during all lockdown, there's no lockdown in banks. So what we did was we uh, gave pl different platforms to these banks because unless the bank is on a digital platform, they their customers cannot come on the platform. Yes. And what we saw is that the bankers realized the value of bringing their customers onto a digital platform because they knew they will not be coming to the branch. Yet they had to service it. They were open. And for everyone, uh, seeing their bank account and uh, doing digital transactions was critical in that whole period. And so in this lockdown, I think the government and the banks have played a very critical role of keeping things stable. Hmm. So that was an important part. And as banks went digital and they allowed their customers to go digital, on the other side, the fintechs uh, and their investors were ready for the acquiring infrastructure. So I think India has done phenomenally well in this lockdown and everyone has contributed to making the life of a common man uh, as smooth as possible, whether it's urban or even rural with products like Aadhaar Enabled Payment System by NPCI. So UPI did amazing in the urban, AEPS did amazing in rural where people had gone without any, suddenly they had found themselves living back in their villages and no access to any uh, form of digital thing. And they could go to a business correspondent just using their Aadhaar, withdraw cash. And that gave them the confidence to stay alive, you know. Yes. These small things do matter. And that's what I think everyone uh, in India has really shown that we are really a technology super Sure. So as we understand, you know, there have been several triggers since the demonetization started. And not only that, especially in the last two, three years, several, all, all around players, whether on the payment side, on the acceptance side, even the government and the regulators, they play their own part in creating the digital payments as we stand today. And we can just hope that they'll scale up from here. Uh, moving on to my next question, and I'll pose this to Jose. What has been the response from the industry player to this sudden and uh, forced change? I think, um, you know, um, yes, the change has been forced, but the premium on innovation has uh, really come about, right? So, as I said, uh, given that the uh, whole pandemic threw up some never uh, heard before use cases, never the scale at which it never happened. so. You know, just to give a very, very simple example, and uh, you know, so we say we talk about uh, home delivery, right? Yeah. And then, uh, even if you were to go to metros in India or uh, you know other places, the delivery boy was not allowed to come up to your residence, yes. so he had to leave something at the gate and go. Yeah. But then he always had a challenge that his network would possibly be there. He would have a bad network uh, area. So even if you were to pay digitally, 
how would the boy actually realize that you've made a payment? Because you're paying from your uh, uh, home and he's at the gate. So uh, there were innovations done. So we, we provided our, uh, you know, the customers that we work with. Where in, in a completely zero network area, you know, you could actually get a confirmation that the consumer has rem remotely paid. So all of this, I think that whole focus around innovation came about. The other is even in, uh, you know, other segments, like for example, B2B payments. Hmm. Hmm? There used to be a lot of non-cash. I mean, there used to be check-based uh, pay payments. Today, uh, I think uh, the pandemic has actually converted these to digital as well. So that initial resistance that, uh, you know, uh, as um, Kostup said, uh, from an acceptance standpoint, merchants had or the whole ecosystem had, that's got transcended. And companies like us also focus now on a lot on B2B payments as well, because initially the B2C was the glamorous part of it, but there's a yeah. lot happening now in B2B. So I think one is the focus on uh, continuous innovations on catering to large use cases and stuff like that. And second is catering to some segments which are not so, you know, glamorous for that right. perspective. Now solutions coming up for them. I'll direct this question to Mandar. So I think the biggest challenge uh, that was faced uh, by uh, probably all companies was overnight everyone had to work from home. Yep. So uh, going to work from home uh, model from uh, being in a situation where every problem you could solve by you know coming together in a one meeting room and suddenly you are not able to meet your customers you are not able to meet your uh, teams and yet you had to uh, grow the, your performance twice or thrice hmm. so it was a big challenge that you had to work from home uh, have the tensions of covid in the family and you know all those things adjusting to the life and yet having the pressure of working at that level where suddenly the digital payments we knew were going to grow because we had seen what happened during the demonetization and so we were expecting a, a huge growth and that happened. So I think the challenges were uh, there for uh, each company to adjust to the new lifestyle and I think what has happened is that the new efficient models uh, are so um, what you can say ingrained into the company that now no longer you have to think of while well, expanding to have double the size of office or everything. Suddenly your same office can you know cater to double the staff or three times the staff and yet be able to work on collaborative ways. And customers also got used to uh, having companies cater to them online. So the cost of travel to the customer and back and wastage of time you know that also was yeah. saved the same team could cater to multiple customers uh, in a particular day instead of one day the team going to Bangalore and next day to Bombay and next day to Pune. You know, so I think this has created a huge efficiency uh, matrix in all the companies and this has also led to super uh, good service and customer service and from here it's only going to get better. Yeah, I feel so too that uh, within the payments ecosystem, I really feel that with the COVID, uh, the payment ecosystem rose up to the challenge and we, we worked on the efficiency and the efficiency was brought out to the fore. And we not only had to survive the pandemic, but we also were quite instrumental in scaling up the businesses, increasing the payments, etc. So yes, definitely it was a watershed moment in terms of efficiency, uh, I feel. Uh, I want to pose this next question to Kosto. We'll start with recent developments in pandemic stricken world has expedited the shift towards digital payments. We know that. However, this has open, also opened a, a you know, digital divide as such in terms of the access to payment instruments, which you were also alluding to your uh, you know, opening remarks. But, well, this could really negatively impact the unbanked and the underserved segments. It also amplified the calls to defend the usage and the role of cash in the economy. But at the, on the other side, uh, the central banks are calling for central bank digital currency. How do you see the uh, future of the payments shaping up from here as we are moving to the new normal? Yeah. So, thanks, thanks, Risha. Yeah. I know this is the top of the town. Uh, uh, what is the view of a central bank relating, relating to CBDC? But before we jump into CBDC, uh, we need to kind of and understand what money means. Uh, money as a medium of exchange and a store value 
has been there for longest time, right? And since time immemorial, so bullion coins, paper notes backed by gold standards, fiat currency backed by central banks, and now what we are seeing is a digital button. So it has evolved over over period over years. Now, if you have to, if you have to look at today, we keep money in two forms. One is a physical cash in the form of notes and coins. Another is a digital money which we keep in the uh, as a deposits in the commercial uh, banks. Now, typically, the confidence in money is anchored by the central bank, and the credibility of the money is underpinned by this two-tier monetary structure where the commercial bank creates money value and the central bank preserves its value. Now, what we have seen from in the last one decade or so. This two-tier structure is being challenged by these three new developments which is come on, which is your cryptocurrency, stable coins, and central bank and digital currency. Now, this enough and more has been spoken about crypto and stable uh, cryptocurrency and stable coins. And I know Sharon is here in this call, so I'm sure I don't want to take his away his thunder on this. But uh, while saying this, I must say that crypto cryptocurrency and stable coin is. If you look at central bank across the world, it's still not considered as a money for the reasons which I mentioned earlier, right? And if I have to look at central bank digital currency, it is it is it is a direct liability of and the payment instrument issued by the central bank, right? And what so so the question here is, or what do you think about what is the stance of MS? I think that's the question which you are asking for. I think before we get into what is the stance of MS? Let's again break it up into saying there are two kinds of CBDCs. One is a wholesale CBDC of the authority. Wholesale, as the name says, it is restricted within the banking industry uh, and the system, and it's more a reserve which the commercial bank keeps, which is the similar kind of our digital reserve keeps it kept in the uh, with the central bank. Similarly, retail CBDC, it will be a digital currency which will be issued to the general public akin to uh, coin and notes, which we see here. Now, MS sees a lot of promises in the wholesale CBDC. And as there is a lot of potential, what we are seeing currently, related to the cross-border payments when it comes to the wholesale CBDC, especially at the settlement lens. Uh, there is a lot of innovations and a lot of experimentation going on right now. And you will hear very soon that these are now uh, actual use case for the cross-border payments. Now, again, what we have to keep in mind that wholesale CBDC is not money because it's not with the general public. It has again been a close user group. Now, retail CBDC, uh, I, I am quite sure that 10 out of six, when it's six out of 10 central banks across the globe are now experimenting on, uh, on this. But what I think is that retail CBDC for Singapore mm. is not urgent right now. And I just want to kind of mention that MD Ravi uh, Menon, uh, the, the head of MAS, he spoke about this in the recently concluded FinTech Festival of Singapore. And he mentioned that there is neither a strong reason for or against the retail CBDC in Singapore. And he said this because he felt that the physical cash is likely to stay for some more time with us. And hence, there is no need for a digital version of a cash right now. The second thing which he felt was that there is a lot of financial inclusion benefit which is already there uh, in, in, in Singapore. At right? most 80, 90 percent of the population is very well backed. So there is this high portion of Singaporeans having bank account and access to the electronic payments. It doesn't make the case gain for uh, retail CBDC. And the third reason where most of the countries are going for a retail CBDC, especially the small nations, are possibility of a currency substitution by a foreign digital currency, yeah. which again is a very remote risk right now for Singapore. So keeping all these things in mind, uh, we, there is no immediate monetary consideration for retail CBDC, but there is a socio-economic consideration. And what MS is also trying to do is to see that what kind of benefit and innovation can come out of this retail CBDC. And hence, we have kind of embarked in projects like Project Orchid to build the technology and the infrastructure of the of the retail CBDC for that, so that in future, we can kind of use some of these technologies 
and come up with a Singapore dollar, a digital dollar. Great points, Costa. Point thank time. you. Uh, I'll post this to Jose. Uh, so I completely concur with Costa in the sense that cash is he will remain for a few years, if not, you know. Uh, I think again from an India perspective, what will change is the um, access to the cash in the account. There will be newer channels that will come, newer payment methods that will come. Right. So today, for example, as you know, uh, Richa, vast majority of Indians have feature phones. Yes. Uh, so could payment, digital payments actually Enable work them. for feature phones? Mm. That's something that will come in. Uh, or, uh, you know, Aadhaar pay based payments as uh, Mandar mentioned. So, a so lot of other new channels will come in to bring in all of these underbanked or unbanked people into the digital fold. What that also means is for businesses, they will now need to have platforms that will cater to all these channels. You cannot only be an online payment acceptance method yeah. only. You need to be truly omni-channel in yeah. that sense. So whether it's doing a, a digital payment, going to a nearby ATM and, you know, making a digital payment from an ATM for all you know, or, you know, things like that. So again, so for a business, it becomes more important uh, to actually roll out payments acceptance across all channels and to have singular platforms that can do that. Sure. Quick comments from you, Manda. Yeah, so digital currency I think will uh, become important as uh, time goes by uh, because it is environmental friendly. That is I think one of the key things and other thing it might also be uh, useful for offline uh, people who are not that online or are scared to go online because of security. They would prefer a digital currency which allows them to be part of the digital economy without uh, having their bank account linked to some online instrument. So digital currency might take uh, different shapes as time goes. And like everything else, I think India would be the showcase or the leader for this technology also in the coming future. I feel so too, and we are all watching with bated breath of what the Reserve Bank of India comes out with the central bank digital currency thing. Uh, hopefully it's expected to come out soon. We are all waiting for it. Uh, watching the space. Uh, my next question is to you, Sharon. How do you see the blockchain technology's role in payments, especially when it comes to cross-border payments? Uh, I think when it comes to payment, right, there's a misnomer that cryptocurrencies are generally a really good payment instrument. I personally don't believe in that. Uh, at least in a country like India, the kind of work that UPI has done is dramatically nice and faster, and I don't think the existing public blockchain serve a purpose there. However, very specifically looking at uh, CBDCs, uh, I think it's a remarkable thing that's coming up. And I think it's important for uh, countries like India and for so many reasons. Uh, one, primarily, while we do talk about digital payments today, whether it's UPI, whether it's payments that you make on Paytm, but essentially there is still money, physical movement of money coming from banks to another bank. Right, so that's, that still happens. And for whatever digital we say, uh, try, try a payment which fails and it takes another five days to come back to your bank account. So the confirmation uh, and the actual value uh, transfer is, is decoupled in the current digital payment system. And that is what CBDC primarily solves. You're actually making a transfer and the actual transfer happens at the same time, right? And that's a very key part of it. That's one discussion. makes so many uh, so many fund releases and stuff earmarked for specific purposes one big challenge because we've worked with uh, or we have kind of work with people who are building up on the cbdc's is that how do you ensure that the funds earmarked for a particular specific purpose is only utilized for that or how can fund issued for uh, buying fertilizers only be issued used for buying fertilizers Right? And this is possible through CBDCs because CBDCs is a programmable money which can specifically say this particular currency can only be used to buy this and nothing else. The payment will fail if you try to make a payment for anything else. And the impact of this is huge. People don't understand that. Uh, it, it, it kills a lot of corruption in the system. Uh, so that's really important. The third part of it is the fact that uh, your entire uh, working with the rest of the CBDCs in the world, right? working with the rest of the central bank, 
uh, digital currencies across the world. Remittances become a huge part of it. Today, India has a huge inward remittance coming in. And a lot of this money gets lost just because of the huge number of intermediaries in between. The time taken for these things to get processed, the swift responses and all of that. I think once the governments collectively start collaborating on CBDCs, we'll see dramatic changes, right? India is supposed to perhaps preside over the 2023 G20. Uh, and if that happens, then our entire work on the CBDCs could play a larger role in building the framework uh, for, for collective uh, payment systems. Really, Chana, and I think, last 15 uh, minutes. And even if you look at the, uh, the statement that the Prime, Honorable Prime Minister has made around how he thinks about the entire digital currency space where he believes that a global framework needs to be created, I think that's the right path. To, looking at the way we have built UPI and all of that, I'm, I'm certainly sure that a country like India will uh, will top uh, this segment when it comes to CBDCs as well. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Sharon, for those comments. Uh, Kostub, I would ask the same question to you. Do you want me to repeat that? No, I do have the... I've got your question. Uh, uh, the, I think your question was more to do with As a technology. blockchain technology and, and a, and a, and a cross-border yes. payments uh, uh, landscape. Now, uh, I think more... CBDC definitely, and Sharon has kind of rightly touched upon many good use cases, especially in the domestic as well as the, uh, the cross-border uh, area. But if I have to specifically look at cross-border, uh, there are four big challenges which a cross-border payment today has, right? And there has been a globally public and private players are trying to address this four, and it can be through a blockchain or a CBDC technology. First one is the cost of operation. Second is the cost of compliance. Third is the cost of integration. And fourth is the cost of offense. Now, MS is also not kind of away from this. And we are looking at this in a very holistic way. So MS is trying to address all these four challenges using this DLT and the blockchain technology, using and again collaborating with public and the private players. So five years ago, uh, we actually launched a project called Project Urban, where we started experimenting the blockchain technology and wholesale CBDCs for the cross-border payments to make it cheaper, faster, and more efficient. Now, that project led to the a successful implementation of another project called Project Patio, which is a blockchain-based interbank clearing and settlement network which is jointly established by DBS Bank of Singapore, JP Morgan, and Tamasek. This will enable banks to settle cross-border payments in different currencies in real time. And using this as a commercial digital bank money or a wholesale uh, CBDC. Now, Project Urban also kind of led to the foundation of something which we have also started called Project Dunbar. It's a blueprint for a multilateral settlement platform which operates across the countries using wholesale CBDCs. And we are working uh, on this with the Bank of International Settlements. Uh, then we are working with the regulators from Australia, Malaysia, and South Africa to come up with this kind of a, a solution where we can use multilateral CBDCs to settle amongst the intermediaries and not and, and remove actually the intermediaries in between, right? And and once this is successful, this will kind of bring down the cost of a cross-border transaction substantially, right? So this is something which we have been working on. And all these things are related to those four challenges which I talked about, and yes. trying to address those four challenges. Yes, some very valid points there, Kostub. And I also feel that technology which can speed up cross-border payments, processing, improve customer experience, reduce transaction costs, which you were also alluding to, and enable efficient and secure payment system is need of the hour. And blockchain technology, if it fits all of these, it has got great and good potential uh, going forward in the fintech space. Uh, incidentally, Meet also, Absolutely. incidentally, Meet Ministry of IT and Technology also came out with a discussion paper on blockchain technology and especially how we can leverage that in the fintech space. So yes, uh, looking forward to that. Sure. Um, I move to my next set of question. It's um, to Jose. The COVID crisis has disrupted aspects of retail payment system, payments pattern, witnessing large and sudden shift as merchants and consumers, you know, went about uh, using both the payment preferences, sorry, changing both the payments preferences as well as mode of transaction. 
how does a payment service provider accommodate those shifts in preferences in a fast-changing environment? Uh, okay. Um, to all the you know startups who are actually part of the audience yes. out here and who have plans of getting into payments, I think the singular big uh, you know learning that we've had is don't try to solve only for problems of today. <laughs> Uh, when you when you actually you know when we actually set up uh, the whole uh, payments platform the whole um, uh, rationale or the direction that we had was look uh, things are evolving so fast so you want to really decouple a whole lot of services and ensure the flexibility and the whole um, the innovation doesn't get curbed just because you sort of architected your solution in a different fashion. So I think number one would be don't don't just plan for challenges of today, but also look at you know things can uh, change overnight because of a regulatory policy. It could be because of service circumstances like pandemic, and unless you are actually uh, architected platforms in a nimble fashion, uh, you know you don't really benefit from those. The other one is. Um, also, uh, you know, going forward, uh, there's been al always a lot of debate on fintechs versus banks. Uh, we, we come in from a, a thought process that uh, fintechs can actually work with banks very closely. And, uh, you know, so there's already an accepted, uh, there's a lot of population in India that's already banked. Can there be solutions that payment service providers actually work with these banks rather than you know, try to compete and start from the very scratch, can we actually value add two existing relationships at banks? Sir? Sure. Uh, with that, I move to my last question because I can see some of couple of questions coming my way and that's the reason I was checking my phone, not being rude. <laughs> um, I'll pose this to Mandar. What about some of the policy implications, the cost of payment for the merchants for or the effects of decreased cash demand on ATM transactions? And of course, could we be looking at the beginning of check system? Um, I think um, uh, what I have seen that the whole zero MDR policy and all those uh, things have actually helped uh, customer adoption and uh, merchants also to adopt to these technologies. And banks also have changed their business model uh, from uh, thinking per transaction revenue to uh, having a float based uh, approach. Uh, that more float comes in, it will help. It's not just MDR that you earn or on the transaction, it's also the float. Also, customer retention happens uh, because if the merchant is not paying heavy MDR, he's likely to uh, continue with the same bank. And what is happening is the cash flows are improving for the merchants as well as the banks. So earlier, the merchants were getting money after a couple of days, digital payment, it's instantaneous. So there are good things that have happened and I think business models will continue to evolve and uh, blockchain-like technologies I think will start getting adopted within the country before they uh, also make effect cross-border. So within the country, blockchain will dynamically change the costs and um, same will happen with the digital currency. So everything finally if the MDR is zero, everyone will have to think innovatively yes. and see how to bring down the cost. And that is what um, the world is watching India, how they could sustain uh, such a large digital infrastructure uh, at low cost and are continuing to do so. So the more the volumes, uh, it is not bringing down cost necessarily, but new models are emerging like how when Google and Facebook came in the, you know, the dot-com uh, aftermath, uh, everyone thought, you know, how is it possible for a company to survive without charging to a customer? Right. But today they are one of the largest in the world. Similar thing I think is going to happen in the fintech world and banks are going to benefit a lot, fintechs are going to benefit a lot. Uh, thanks, Mandar. And some very quick comments from Jose, your side. Yeah. Um, as um, Mandar rightly said, you know, uh, with the government push towards reducing MDR, in fact, uh, yesterday you would have read about the government actually 1,500 crores towards uh, rupee and yes. UPI proportions. So I think uh, with all of this, uh, I think digital payments is here to stay and grow. And uh, as again, uh, you know, referring to the previous question also, you know, the whole collaboration between fintechs and banks have to grow. Newer technologies like blockchain will uh, 
possibly fast forward a lot of things that we're doing like uh, for example shan mentioned about settlements mm -hmm. you know can it be blockchain based settlements that will mention uh, that will result in almost immediate settlements happening right. so yes things technologies like blockchain technologies like tokenization yes. these would also you know bring in that much more user confidence in the platform and uh, all in all i think all of this have to go in parallel to you know see the growth in Thank you for your response, so gentlemen. I have a couple of questions, so I'll take some of them since we have about three to four minutes left with us. Um, first question is, can the same programmable money also be resolved with e-rupee? I think, Sharon, you were alluding to that, that the same amount of, uh, you know, uh, you said something about the sum amount, same amount of money that the government gives should be used for that particular purpose, whether it is a fertilizer or agriculture. So it is in that context that if we can use the programmable money, which can also be resolved with e-rupee, if you can take this question. I think I think e rupee kind of tries yep. to solve for the same problem. Uh, CBDCs will eventually solve in a much better fashion, uh, right? Because here the distribution, the tracking, and all of that becomes extremely mm -hmm. simple. Uh, but it still has an element. While it's it's in a way kind of programmable for the, to say the way it operates. However, I think uh, still the reconciliation and the tracking of it would still be a little cumbersome as compared to what it could have achieved if it was a serious. Sure. Uh, I have another question which I'll post to Jose because it's on payment gateways. Uh, we know digitalization is good. What about the problems that we face in our current lending ecosystem where transfer takes time and still we face delays from banks involved in payment gateways? Swift, re swift response is missing. What should be the resolution? So um, today largely, at least again in the Indian context, uh, the central bank has been, uh, you know, quite uh, at it in terms of resolving these challenges for both consumers and businesses. So there are very, very clear guidelines laid down in terms of, you know, response times for addressing qu queries and questions from both the businesses as well as, uh, and and these are uh, pretty much now being adopted by every payment player in the country. So I think we have come a long way from where we were. Uh, in fact, uh, just last week we were actually chatting with uh, the regulator as well. And uh, there are also thoughts on how, uh, you know, certain other um, payment instruments which really don't come under the ambit of the uh, regulator today re directly. Uh, possibly a little more of regulation around that to ensure um, settlements, uh, to ensure in case of a transaction timeout, what happens, all of that coming in. So I think gradually um, all payment modes would get covered under this. And uh, I think the regulator has been very, very progressive in addressing. And uh, I think singularly that consumer experience and confidence has been one of the basic pillars in which the regulator has been moving forward. Sure. Thanks, Jose. So I really feel that we have to manage the two universe where on the, other hand, on the one hand, as per the latest reports, we see that digital payments in India is going to exceed $1 trillion by 2026. And on the other hand, we have uh, we, we still face so uh, many people defend the use of cash because it still remains what can be trusted, what can be touched. It's, uh, you know, it's still psychologically seen as a better method of payments. So I would say digital is not the an end of cash per se, but rather a different format. And we need to manage to um, merge the, these two ends of the universe. Uh, I would like to thank you, FinTech Festival of India, and all my esteemed panelists for the opportunity to interact with you. Thank you very much, and stay safe. What a power-packed panel and such interesting conversations. We thank everyone for joining us on this panel today. Sorbia mein Bitcoin trading. Possible hai. Impossible. Lagi sir. Aur hara to. It's possible on CoinSwitch Kuber. Download karo aur Bitcoin mein trading start. CoinSwitch Kuber. Sikka chamke ga. Cryptocurrency is an unregulated digital asset. Not a legal tender and subject to market risks and price fluctuation risks. Where there is life. There is hope, there is meaning, but life has its downs, as much as its ups. Life is about challenges, life is about opportunities. Time for joy, time for celebration, and time to introspect. Thankfully, in every one of life's moments, and even beyond life itself, there's LIC. 
Where there is life, there's always LIC. Zindagi ke saath bhi, zindagi ke baad bhi.